Hello everyone and welcome to CS300 Software Engineering. Uh, want to hope you all are doing safe and well out there during these difficult times. I want to start today talking about Agile software development, which is the big new trend in software development for the last 15 or 20 years and uh, doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. I want to warn you that I'm going to express a lot of my own opinions uh, during this talk and I'll try to flag those when they happen. The world is of software development is very, very excited about their Agile methodologies, and I want to look at that and talk a little bit about why. Also provide a little comparison and contrast with more traditional uh, methodologies. I, I think it's important that we don't believe that some particular development process or methodology is the silver bullet for uh, slaying all the software development werewolves. Uh, Fred Brooks in his famous book with the now dated title the mythical man month said that there are no silver bullets for software he also he wrote a very famous essay to that effect and i tend to agree with that but that said agile is what people are using so you need to learn it agile is got some advantages and so you need to understand those so that's what we'll do let's just quit talking around it and go ahead and get started so uh let me find my notes here Let's start the way every discussion of, of Agile software starts, which is a discussion of something that I've called uh, for years straw man waterfall. And that's a very colorful name. The book calls it plan driven development. And for some reason, the advocates of Agile seem very excited to pick the silliest possible version of this plan driven development process to compare agile methods to and it really is a straw man it really is something from which you can draw a lot of false conclusions but let's talk about sort of our textbooks and the sort of standard like i say throughout the agile training community presentation in that idea we step in we make a plan and then we execute that plan and the plan involves stepping through the requirements phase figure out what we're going to build and getting that nailed down getting it to the point where we have an elaborate document that is it got a great deal of detail about exactly what we're building that might take a long time to produce and be very difficult when we've perfected that when it's just what we want then we start figuring out how we're going to build it and we conceive of an architectural design, we conceive of a detailed design, and both those design, you know, the, the high level and the low, lower level design elements, again, we make them perfect. We, uh, we spend a lot of effort into it. And we really, really hope that during the design phase, we don't have to go back and revisit the requirements. The idea here is that it's sort of a failure if somehow as you start to design the software you discover there are issues with the requirements so you're hoping not to do that you're trying not to do that you're trying as best you can to produce a design that meets these already perfected requirements when you've done that you build your thing which is easy now because you have a detailed design it's just a simple matter of coding as we all know that's easy enough and then when you're done and you better hope and you better have ensured that your design is perfect because you don't go back you know you you build the implementation that, of what your design said to build and then when you're done you do your with that you do your QA phase you check it and you make sure that it's exactly what you meant to build after you've perfected the code now you make sure and check that everything's perfect and the idea here of this sort of hypothetical plan driven model of what we call the waterfall model is that you do all this in one pass you know if you have your project you spend 30 percent of the time building a perfect set of requirements then 30 percent of the time doing a perfect design, then 20% of the time doing a perfect implementation, and then 20% of the time doing perfect QA. And when you're done, you have a product ready to ship. And you plan all that at the very beginning. You do clever planning and scheduling. And now you've built a gem of a project with zero rework. Um, 
it's called the waterfall model because we go, we flow down the waterfall. We start, you know, we do this phase, then this phase, this phase, this phase. It all goes downhill. You never back up any more than a waterfall would. And obviously this isn't a real thing. Obviously in real life, things are more complicated than that. And it's a recipe for disaster to try to do things that way. The agile people assert this. The classical software engineering people assert it too. Nobody thinks this is a real thing. This process originally arose out of Department of Defense contract stuff back in the 70s when the Department of Defense, US Department of Defense was trying to figure out how to purchase software in such a way that the contractors actually did a good job of delivering what they were supposed to, what the customer, the government wanted in a timely fashion. And it maybe worked okay in that setting, but maybe not. And certainly that's about the only place where that kind of thing ever works very well, just like we described it. Was well, there an easier, you know, the problem here is that first of all, you know, you try to get your requirements perfect and then the requirements are defective anyway, because you, it's really hard to get requirements perfect in isolation. And, you know, you end up producing sometimes literally for a large project, tens of thousands of pages of documentation of requirements. An artifact that big is inevitably going to be full of troubles and messes. And it's really hard to validate the requirements when they're that big and complicated. And then you do a design that takes too long to get right and then is wrong anyway, because it's really hard to do a design that big in a single blob. Um, you know, there's not enough time for coding, which is of course the only imp important part of development. And I put the sarcastic symbol there because, you know, really coding should not be that big a part of your software project in almost any setting, but it's the part coders like, it's the part programmers like, and so it tends to be overemphasized. And then of course, if you make mistakes in requirements and design, and then you discover them at the end of your project, you know, after you've done QA and everything, your project is perfect and somebody looks and says, oh, that isn't actually what the requirements said, or, well, maybe what the requirements said, but it's not what the customer wanted. That's really expensive to go back to the top and sort of flow all that down through that whole process again. So not a valid strategy. Nobody claims it's a valid strategy. Here's what companies often use for larger projects in more difficult domains in the modern software engineering world. And this is a very much out there methodology. It's very much, you'll see it in the wild occasionally still. Uh, and that's the incremental iterative version of this. So rather than trying to just make the water flow downhill all the time, guaranteed, we first of all break the project up into increments. We're going to say, well, what is the first version of the project going to look like? And we'll build product or whatever look like, and we're going to just build that. And then we may maybe add to it in a next increment and so forth. And you do it iteratively. You work backwards as you need to and check as you go. So instead of saying, well, we just strictly go from one thing to the other, we might, you know, since we're working with much smaller chunks, we can afford to sort of back up, fix the requirements related to the piece we're working on now, um, be flexible about redesigning and things. And so with all that extra flexibility, things go a little earlier. Uh, you still want to make sure that you and this is really important, QA is not delayed to the end in an incre incremental iterative waterfall process. You do it as you go as much as you can, and um, you plan testing and you plan inspections as soon as you can, as soon as you know what it is you're gonna be testing or inspecting and how you're gonna do it. And then when you, get, you execute the tests as quick as you can, and that way you get short cycle feedback that tells you you need to go back and fix some stuff, and that, that's sort of the, the, the real world version of the process. It works pretty well in the real world. It especially works well for projects that are difficult to construct because it gives you some handle on your complexity and it gives you some handle on uh, the right way, you know, gives you some planning and thinking time for the right way to do things earlier on. And for a long time, that was sort of the standard in the real world of how we built software.
Cool. The agile movement started probably the late 80s would be a good time to say that it really took off, although the roots are older than that. And it's this idea that maybe all this infrastructure and you know, large documents describing things that are going to be built and endless meetings and all this planning, a lot of which, you know, seems wasted because you throw pieces of it away anyway. Maybe we don't need that much stuff. Maybe we can reduce this overhead, which is activity, to quote the book, that doesn't contribute directly to rapid product delivery. So anything that, you know, isn't part of actually building the product, we're gonna to try to cut that out. And you know, I'm being very sarcastic at this point because you know, just like the Agile people give straw man waterfall, I'm a little bit giving straw man Agile, but I think I'm trying to be fair to it too as someone who's been trained in it and has some experience. Um, so, you know, when I say cut twice, measure once, obviously that's a joke, but the idea here is to replace thinking and planning with action. And that sounds great until you think about it a little more and then it gets a little worrisome, but that's what people are doing. So there we are. You know, so what kinds of things are, you know, don't contribute directly to rapid product delivery? Well, you know, detailed specification documents of requirements, eh, not so directly to rapid product delivery. So, uh, you know, they kind of go by the wayside. Uh, QA in cycle and post cycle tends to be minimized. We tend to do very simple forms of testing as our and very cursory inspections as our main product because you know QA doesn't contribute to wrap directly to rabbit product delivery beyond a certain point. The book talks about how we don't write a lot of extensive process documentation. You know, we're not gonna produce big documents because those don't contribute directly to rapid product delivery. <sighs> yeah, okay. And, you know, this is sort of a parody of what you must really be doing, but it's just like, you know, Straw Man Waterfall is a parody of what you must really be doing, but it's a parody that really fits a lot of what agile people want to do pretty well. The book makes the claim that almost all software projects are all, are now developed with an agile approach. I don't believe that to be true, except in some very sort of self, sort of vacuous sense that, you know, th that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but certainly a lot of it is, and certainly a lot of you you personally watching this video will probably for your first software projects be working in an environment that does some form of agile. So there we are. So what are we doing? Here's something called the Agile Manifesto that was written a long time ago. I forget exactly when. And sort of describes this idea. Uh, we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it. The authors of the Agile Manifesto wrote, this is all a quote. We're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. One of the authors and signers of about the 20 or so that wrote and signed this together, one of the principal ones and one of the most influential ones was a man named Ward Cunningham, is a man named Ward Cunningham, who's a Portlander. He's a friend of mine. Um, he is the creator of the wiki. He was one of the earliest very vocal agile people. He's the person I learned, one of the people I learned object-oriented programming from in the 80s. Um, and this is, there's a lot of value in this kind of a statement, I think, but 
I think it's also really easy to overbalance that. There's value in the items on the right, but we value the items on the left more as a very balanced statement. Um, the fact of the matter is that in the in 2020, tools are a big deal and processes are a big deal because processes and tools help have better interactions and better individuals, um, you know, better individual contributions. We found that tools can be built to make things work better, um, you know, in the sort of left-hand side sense. We don't write giant documents anymore. Nobody wants to do that. But on the other hand, not writing down what you're doing is a frequent source of bad problems. We try to capture documentation in less painless ways than we use, in more pain more painless ways than we used to. We try to capture it with doc comments and uh, get log messages and that sort of thing rather than capturing it with uh you know big word documents or tear off documents or whatever but we still try to capture some of it it's still important and you'll notice that there again the tools you know get and uh you know document extractors for source code are a big part of how we get a workable amount of documentation so that we while still concentrating on working software uh, contract negotiation is a big deal it's semi out of scope for this course but I'll occasionally talk about it at the end of the day you know this book wants to pretend that all software is built by as products and that everything you sell everything is sold with some kind of generic shrink wrap license to a customer um that isn't how things work in the real world and when you get away from that model then there's some real issues thinking about what constitutes collaboration th through contract negotiation versus contract negotiation customers aren't always good people acting in good faith i hate to break that to you but it's how it goes and you know responding to change sounds great but if you're not following a plan, then it's really easy to get in stuck in local suboptima or to wander off into nowhere. The bottom line here is that the whole point of a global plan, of a global strategy, is that your tactics then you can evaluate in light of what's my plan? How am I gonna try to get from here to there? And if there's very far away, uh, you, it's really a good idea to have some global strategy. If you were trying to drive from here to New York, you know, just saying, look, we're not going to plan around on the map before we go. We're just going to kind of follow our noses and see how it goes. Yeah, you'd probably get there, but you might make some interesting mistakes along the way, too. So, what's the dream? What's the thing we really want to have here? Well, we'd like to reduce ceremony, as it's referred to in the community. We'd like to reduce sort of stuff that's sort of activity for the sake of activity and spend more time grinding out the code that we actually need to solve the problem that that's sort of part of the dream another part of the dream is that you know rather than doing risk management by extensive planning we're going to do it by keeping our cycles of development short and actually seeing what works on the fly and that might be an easier plan there if we keep our increments of work small if we keep our tasks small and our, our times of tasks small, then maybe it's easier to direct the project where we want to go, and maybe it's easier to schedule the project in the way it needs to be scheduled to get to where we want when we need to be there. And finally, if the QA is done continuously as part of the process, um, Maybe that's less rework. Maybe you know, discovering problems by actually running things and seeing what works and what doesn't is a good way to avoid rework, so much rework by being able to fix things sooner and fix them easier. And so maybe we'll end up with both less effort and a better product. So that's the dream. And to some extent for some projects, that's a real dream. It's a thing that really happens. And so, you know, for you as a potential line developer, to some extent, you're going to start out without much choice in these matters. You'll use whatever process the people you're working with are using, and you will learn that process and learn to adapt to it. Uh, you'll learn whatever methods they're using, and you'll learn to do them. 
so that's part of why I think it's so important to talk about Agile is because that's likely to be what you're going to run into. And these, this is why. This is why your bosses or your colleagues or whoever have grabbed Agile is because they have this dream. But I am going to close a little bit with a little bit of whining. Um, here's my cynic's view of Agile. This is me being grumpy about it. First of all, you know, that manifesto we saw is fantastic. And there's a lot of really fantastic statements like that. But at the end of the day, most implementations I've seen of Agile methods don't really follow rules. They don't really know what they're doing. A man, an experienced manager at a local company once described it as scrum butt. Um, you know, scrum is an Agile method. And she said, oh, yeah, everybody I talk to, you know, they'll, they'll say, yeah, we're doing scrum. But, and uh, that stuck. I think there's a lot of sort of, well, I'm not gonna follow any rules or anything. It's agile, I can do whatever I want. And doing whatever I want was what got us the software crisis in the first place to some degree, so it's not an exciting place to be. A lot of times agile is code, it's an excuse. I don't wanna write any documentation, especially internal documentation, but I don't have to, because we're doing agile. I don't wanna, you know, build a test plan, but there is no test plan because it's Agile and there are no test plans in Agile. And so sort of Agile is code for whatever it is that people are cranky about doing. Um, the smaller the project it is, the better that Agile works on it, for sure. The easier cases where requirements and design are not the hardest part, like web and mobile apps that, you know, where requirements means what is it we want to do in some very vague sense and design is what does our user interface look like i'm going to use a framework that provides the user interface at that point you know sure agile works great for that and can save a lot of planning and messing around but anything's going to work great for those cases but you know the interesting thing is that these days that's what you're, you're likely to be hired for. That's where all the energy and attention is these days is in web and mobile apps. And so, yeah, maybe Agile's the process of the future for them. I thought table 2.2 in the text was super interesting. This is this table that says, when you're doing incremental development, like you do in Agile, what do you do? You pick features to be included in the increment. You refine the feature descriptions so that you really understand what how you're gonna build this particular feature of the product you're building. You implement and test the feature, you integrate the feature and then test the do integration testing, and then you deliver the system increment, which sounds like a great process and for the you know most part it is. It's interesting to me that design is literally just left out. There's no point in here in which anything is described that sounds anything like actually figure out how to solve the problem. And I don't think that's, I think that's not because the author wouldn't value design as a thing. It's just that these agile processes tend to be thrown at things where design isn't a big piece, where there's no hard algorithms to find, where there's no hard parallelism to try to figure out, where there's no hard, uh, you know, figuring out what how it is you're gonna do this stuff, right? No hard storage management, whatever. You know, when it's throwing code it stuff in the cloud, you don't need much of a design phase and so it doesn't show up. And but to me it's a really telling omission because it's you know points up sort of how lost you can get. The thing is, the more you fix these problems, we'll look at Scrum here in a bit in an, in a talk to down the road here. Scrum is a particular agile method and you look at how it's executed carefully. That's a lot in common with incremental iterative waterfall. It wants so badly to be different. There's a lot of what's going on that's very continuum here. You know, it's not like you choose between straw man waterfall at one end or the most agile agile at the other end. There's lots of choices. There's lots of ways you can do things. Like we talked about last week, it's real easy when your only interface with customers, and this is true in a lot of these agile projects, is, worth, is through some project owner, if that. If you're the one guessing what features need to be in the product you're building, as developers, 
that can be a real problem. One of the things that the fancy requirements process in waterfall style methods do and plan driven methods do is try to make sure that there's engagement with the customers up front so you really understand what the customers need and want. A lot of times that includes a big piece of getting domain knowledge about their domain, of really digging down into what is this thing we're building and you know what is it you folks do again and how is this going to work with that and whether it's a product driven development or project driven development that's going to be true and the last thing like i mentioned earlier is sort of it'd be great to think that everything is product development software product development but it isn't there's still an awful lot of you who are going to end up working in situations where you're not building product you're building projects a lot of software is still consumed internally and that's fine that you can use agile without too much problems there because it's hard to write a contract with yourself but a lot of it too is done as contract work it's done you know as one organization providing software to an outside customer the outside customer really wants written down and you if you're a smart developer really want written down exactly who's doing what on what scale you know with what things and you want a lot of detail in that because just as a matter of law and human nature you know there again the, the agile manifesto oh we really want you know customer interaction and collaboration and that sounds great but there's no activity so pleasant and collaborative that introducing money into it doesn't make a big problem. And that's the point at which you really wanna have things written down. A very close friend of mine worked for a long time as a contract, software contractor in a large contract organization. And they spent probably 20 or 30% of their effort on front end activities, requirements and design related to writing out a real solid contract. So that later when the customers came back and asked them to build a bunch of things, that they hadn't asked for before and claimed that they, you know, oh yeah, you, you promised you'd build this. No, we didn't. They could get out a piece of paper and say, look, no, we didn't. You know, we need to talk about how much more you're gonna pay us and what you're gonna give up to get this thing you want now. Um, the customer wants to be protected in that way. You know, you deliver them something that's nothing like what they asked for. Well, this is what you asked for. No, it wasn't. You really want it written down. So there are situations still where, uh, more front-end activity may be an appropriate way to go. So that's what I have for you. I hope that I was super clear about what was my opinion and what the actual things are. And as we start to dig more into Agile over the next couple of talks, you should get a better idea of how Agile works and what's going on. Um, but I hope this is helpful for you. I, like I say, I hope you're staying safe and well in this difficult time. And I will talk to you again soon. Thank you for listening.